This week on FX Guide TV. We go to Animal Logic to discuss the 3D pipeline that allowed them to assemble the new Lego movie. This and more coming up next. Hello, I'm Angie and welcome to FX Guide TV. Now, while I would never admit it to my five-year-old nephew, I had my doubts about the new Lego film. But ever since we saw the first trailer, the Lego movie by Animal Logic has been gaining momentum. With sharp dialogue and great comic Lego timing, this animated feature is really quite different from most animated films. Mike visited Animal Logic to discuss the complexity of animating block toys to such great comic effect. Oh my gosh, I love this song! Everything is awesome. Always use a turn signal, park between the lines, yes! Drop off dry cleaning before noon, read the headlines, don't forget to smile, always root for the local sports team. Go sports team! Always return a compliment. Hey, you look nice. So, so do you. you. Drink overpriced coffee. There you go, that's $37. Wow, awesome! So, uh, how did you go about uh, basically designing and blocking and lensing this film? Well, at the start, we did a lot of uh, research into, I guess, one of the big problems that we were trying to, to um, solve for an audience is we wanted people to believe that uh, what they were seeing was something real. So we had to do a lot of um, research into what made stop motion film look real, what, what, what's the kind of visual language there and um, what that would mean for us. Um, there's also a couple of other things that w were surprising when you're shooting uh, minifigs. Uh, they have very different proportions to people. So a lot of the rules that you would uh, assume that you could naturally kind of apply uh, in terms of framing were quite different. We had to almost reinvent everything. Right, so there was a sort of fundamental assumption you're going to film it as if they are true scale and Absolutely. lens as yep. if you were filming something that was just tiny in front of a lens. Right, exactly. So we basically wanted people to, to look at the film and go, oh, that's real Lego. Um, and, and that's, I think we kind of we got there. It's pretty good. So in terms of blocking uh, and setting that sort of stuff up, the characters clearly are restricted in their movement by the nature of being this kind of stop frame kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Did it change how you went about setting up the, the blocking and the framing, especially given it was in 3D? Uh, the 3D definitely had an impact on that. Um, we're very conscious of the way you cut off the character with the edge of the frame, that kind of stuff. Um, but not really in terms of, of staging. We we had a really fluid process and we, we were able to experiment a lot, which was a real luxury. Um, so yeah, we, in that sense, it was pretty similar to, to other films in that you could get in there with the characters, block out the motion, shoot it, have a look, talk to the directors, and then you know keep iterating until we had something that, that everyone was happy with. Were you floating a window to give you more stereo depth into the uh, space? Uh, that was done as a, po a post-process after, after the um, lensing, so yeah. So in terms of those lenses, is there a natural correlation to real lenses or did you just sort of make yeah. up your own versions? Uh, no, we have proxies, I guess, for, for real world, world lenses. So depth of field would be accurate to those real world lenses yep. or just your own? Yeah, we had accurate depth of field. We also, we had the luxury of being able to turn it on and off um, at the hit of a button. So it was really easy to, for us to compose the shots as we wanted to and then worry about the depth of field almost as the second step. Because so. in a stereo point of view, one might say, well, you don't really want to have a huge amount of depth of field because I can look around the screen because it's in stereo. But right. as a miniature, you want the exact opposite. You want heaps of yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to give away depth. And actually, when you're focusing the audience uh, to look at the convergence point with that depth of field, that really helps a lot with the stereo. I think it, um, it lets you go a little bit deeper because it, you don't have that problem where people are looking around as much all over the place. You kind of, everything's focused to the place where you naturally want to look. So there are shots where the action is twos, might even be threes, I couldn't tell, but uh -huh. the camera work isn't, Yeah, which of course defeats the render advantage of twosing in the first place. Yeah. Um, did you ever look at trying to step the actual frames as opposed to just stepping the animation within them? Yeah, we had a look at it. We played with a lot of variations um, and that was always a conversation between animation and the layout department. Um, most of the time it was fine. You just, sometimes if, if the character was really close, animated on twos, and then the camera was doing something, you know, a smooth kind of elegant move into it, you start to become aware 
the biggest tell was the depth of field popping. It would, you'd have to really work the focus every single frame to make sure that it wouldn't. And even then you'd start you get a little bit of swimming with the focus. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, it was a case by case basis. There wasn't a formula to answer that question. It was just, you know, um, we'd look at each, each shot as it came, discuss with animation what, you know, if there's any, any leeway there or, um, but yeah, it was never a huge problem. It was never a deal breaker. We always found a solution. To, to, to How do you approach it. virtual cinematography? Do you say, I can get this camera to pivot on its nodal point and it's perfect because that's what I can do? Or do yeah. you say, you know what, I want to make it feel slightly imprecise to get for the fact that the yeah. nodal pivot point is off center with, say, a tripod? Uh, it depends, again, case by case. But personally, I think whatever you can do to get away from that nodal pivot is really helpful. So there's a there's a subconscious language of cinema that people are used to, and I think uh, 3D cinematography can sometimes be a little bit too, uh, as you're talking about, all on one axis and and all pivoting from the same place. And it's just it's quite powerful when you can get away from that. We had um, some Steadicam virtual Steadicam rigs, um, they're all keyframe animated. There wasn't any live capture, but we used those to great effect. I think um, to really make you feel like there was a camera operator there. Um, and that stuff, when it's, it, it can be really, really powerful. And yet I didn't really see you going heavily into hunt and seek on focus or framing. You stayed no. away from looking kind of obviously. Yep. So there must be a line there of sort of becoming aware of that and not. Yeah, and these are all the things that we kind of developed um, as the style of the film as we went. I mean, we started off trying to overshoot with the focus a little bit and it just, because the depth of field is so extreme, you're just so aware of it that we pretty quickly shut that down and focus was perfect, but we'd overshoot with the motion of the camera and give, trying to give the camera weight. That was one of the trickiest things on this film. And it's actually one of the biggest things uh, to give scale as well, because what 3D cameras like to do is to interpolate very smoothly and perfectly. Um, and that takes all the weight out. So a lot of the time we were trying to imagine how big the camera would be that we were using here and how far could you actually move that on a table and what would that look like relative to the minifigs. And, and essentially what that gives you is a kind of quite big steps in the increments. Um, even when the camera's moving and going to a stop, we didn't want it to be too smooth. We'd always be pushing uh, to see how far we can, we can make it uh, feel organic and real. So contrasting with that restraint, mm -hmm. Were there any other scenes where you went the other way and tried to get you know more movement in or handheld kind of vibe or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's one scene in particular which is uh, a scene where Emmett's being interrogated, and it comes kind of towards the start of the film. But at that, at that point in the movie, we've only had quite uh, formal, very locked off, as you said, uh, cameras. And this is uh, it's the first moment where Emmett kind of realises something bad is happening to him. So we really tried to push that in terms of having handheld cameras and giving the audience a sense of uneasiness, a kind of subconscious uneasiness. Um, so that was a real challenge. That's uh, one of the sequences we use a lot of the virtual steady cam rigs. Um, and uh, yeah. What properties did that virtual steady cam give you uh, that you wouldn't have got from just drawing a, you know, a vector in space and moving the camera along? Um, so it gives you a much more nervous feeling. It's a, and, um, and hopefully the effect that we we'll, would get is that the audience will subconsciously feel that. So they'll, rather than having a very locked off camera where everything feels safe and ordered, the camera is moving a lot and like correcting and adjusting. Um, it gives it kind of a nervous intensity, hopefully. Um, and is it literally pivoted like a steady cam with a, an yeah. access point way lower than the camera? Yeah, it was. It was, um, so you'd be moving, uh, lower pivoting from kind of essentially a kind of a hip level on a on a minifig so it was like a little minifig steady cam operator it was pretty cute actually <laughs> um so the animation in this uh kind of feels like you've got you've achieved a lot incredibly successfully but it's like you had one arm tied behind your back from an animation point of view you're not allowed to do the sort of things that squatch and stretch uh, secondary follow-on animation there's no bits of moving clothing to sort of rustle and stuff i mean yep. it's was it just really hard to animate these it looks so simple well surprisingly enough despite all of the restraint um 
you know, as you said, the, the, the end result's beautiful and it works really, really well. And I think one of the really interesting things about the design problem or the creative problem is uh, being true to the medium. So Lego is such a creative medium. There's there's so many things that you can do with it, as is, you know, evidenced by its, its duration and its and its uh, long-standing history with, with kids and everything. And I think that really came to the fore when we started doing animation. So despite the fact that you don't have squash and, squash and stretch and you don't have all these amazing kind of um, antics to sell stuff, um, there was a, there's a, there's a sort of a, a truth to the medium in that in that when you start to animate these things, they're like your imagination. It's like you're playing with the minifigs, and you know you really get a sense of uh, these guys being little characters that are in your mind. You know, so despite the restraint and despite the sort of what seems to be a lack of tools to be able to create this amazing animation, it ended up being quite the opposite. You know. Um, one of the other things too that was really, really important is that we gave the animators the ability to start to put their own bricks into their shots. So rather than really us defining up front what was in a shot sort of in its entirety, um, some of the tools would enable the animators to, uh, to bring bricks in and build little things, you know, and you ended up with this, you know, great uh, kind of supporting cast of just incidental stuff that, that was really quite, um, uh, you know, exciting to see and, and, and very creative. You could result. pull almost any facial expression as a, I'm going to say, UV map on a face. Sure. You couldn't kind of shrug or tilt a head in anywhere near the way you can on a normal character. Well, it's funny because the guys would, tr they would want to do a shrug. So it'd be like, okay, well, how are we going to do a shrug? And, and they would, they would inevitably come up with some strange combination of an arm move and a, and a torso and a, and a head tilt that would imply a shrug. And, and when you were looking at the performance, you'd immediately get it as a shrug, but, but it wasn't just your standard kind of okay you've got a you know a collarbone and you give it some of this and that's your shrug it was it was a really nice creative combination of all the bits while working around that that kind of truth to the medium you know there's some flames that come out of the bottom of a seat or an apparatus or something and i was looking at that and i was saying well normally that'd be the fx team right they just produce a fluid sim or a gaseous slim and stuff but here because it wasn't that, I was wondering, was that sort of what I would call effects animation done by a traditional animator, yep. or was the effects guys having to just feed everything through some kind of pixelization, blocky, voxel thing? Yeah, well, it was, a, it was a really nice combination of the two. So I mentioned before the animators had the ability to sort of bring bricks into their scene, and sometimes they would. So if, for example, you had a, you know, a fight scene and, and one character hits another, the animator could say, oh, I've got, there's a, I know, there's a, there's a little uh, magic wand brick that we could use as a spark that comes off the face of the character. And they had the ability to go and, and pull those bricks in completely arbitrarily. Now, on the other hand, there might be some very heavy effects work to do. So um, say there was a, a, a the street caught on fire, the, the effects artist would actually have particle simulations that would produce those bricks. So the bricks would be appearing, you know, randomly and, and doing the animation uh, that they defined as a particle simulation. So there were two, two very distinct kind of workflows, um, but the same creative result, which is like, it's all brick based, it's all true to the medium, and it's controlled, you know, as a brick moving in space. So on paper, you'd think it was an easier render because it's hard surfaces, though I noticed quite a lot of transparency, so I'm assuming subsurface in those materials that warranted it. Yeah. Was that an easy render? No. <laughs> um, perhaps the most difficult thing about this is the geometric complexity. So everybody, when you say Lego, uh, you kind of think to yourself, you know, the, the standard Lego brick, which is a, you know, three by two, or whatever it is, um, and that, in everybody's mind, that's what Lego is. But these days, Lego is so incredibly complex. There's so much detail in those bricks. There's an internal structure to them. There's, um, you know, there's the little Lego logo on the top of it. Now, all of that stuff is, I, I reckon, it's permanently imprinted in our brains. Like, we know when you see a Lego brick, that doesn't look like a Lego brick. So, not only is the geometric detail highly complicated, but the actual material itself. So there's subsurface scatter going on in all of the bricks um, to a varying degree. There's obviously transparency, as you pointed out. Um, so there's a huge amount of complexity in the shading. Now, because we were true to medium and we really, really didn't want to cheat uh, the brick nature of the film, everything in the film is made out of bricks. So that means even the background stuff is effectively brick made. Now, we had to work out uh, ways to optimize our renders so that we could cull you know, 99% of the geometry that's actually there. So all of that internal detail, all of the stud detail, all that kind of stuff. So while we're true to the medium, we're very, very efficient with the way that we select the geometry that we're going to render. So it was a very, very difficult rendering problem. But um, at the end of the day, we got very, very good at it. And by the um, the end of the film, I was saying to the Lego guys, I think we're the most efficient brick render rendering, you know, facility in the world without a doubt. So yeah. If ever there was a film that I would have thought procedural stuff would be uh, in play, it'd be this one. Was there just a bank of guys working out how to take an X model and reduce it procedurally to Lego? Well, there were tools that did that, but that was more for our large-scale um, 
uh, environments. So there's a scene there where we, we go through a canyon and we have some incredible tools where you could build uh, a surface and then obviously our procedural tools would fill that with certain bricks and then we could stratify that with different colours and we had different layers of types of bricks and those kinds of things. And that was really helpful for those vast kind of uh, uh, environments. But when it comes to uh, buildings and those types of things, there was none of it. We actually built all of that stuff very uh, particularly and there were guys there who actually constructed those things brick by brick. So just walk me through the technical pipeline. So uh, what were you effectively pre or, or blocking out in, and then where did it move from that? So uh, at the very front of the pipeline, obviously there's some design and stuff, but we actually used uh, an off-the-shelf uh, Lego piece of software, which anybody can download. It's called uh, LDD, which is Lego Digital Designer. Um, and that's a great tool set for building Lego, you know, not surprisingly. Um, and uh, it is uh, basically access to the Lego library. Um, it uh, controls... Um, um, Lego uh, to Lego uh, sticking, so snapping, basically. Um, and the guys would, would mock up, even in the art department, would mock up these kind of designs. Um, and from that, we had uh, an external library where we'd sub built subdivision versions of the bricks. Uh, each one of the bricks was built by us, a uh, unique um, build, sub-D uh, capable. Um, we would then basically take the LDD model, convert that into a shell um, uh, of multiple different types. So we had like a render shell, we had a display shell, we had a whole bunch of other different types of shells that could be used in different parts of the pipeline. Um, and then from that we would build the environment. Uh, we would also build characters and that kind of stuff. So at the very front end of the pipeline we have a very brick-based approach. When we got into um, uh, layout and those types of things or for the environment, the guys would position all of the instances of various buildings around and, and we would record that in our, again, in our proprietary sort of um, uh, uh, format, which is effectively a config file that specifies where all the assets go. We would then construct all of those things into a shot for animation. Uh, they would get presented with the display versions of those shells, so that's all OpenGL optimized and those kinds of things. Um, they would then animate in XSI uh, doing uh, all the various animation. That would then come out of XSI and go into um, uh, lighting or effects. When effects got it, they would go into Houdini. And as I said, this is all passing down the pipe in our geometry, uh, proprietary geometry format. Um, and as I said, it maintains the record of all the bricks that are in all those assets. When that gets into effects, they could turn around and they could take that shell and they could say, okay, well, we're going to blow this building up and we're going to turn it into bricks. So they would go back and um, sort of uh, devolve that asset into its brick nature and blow all those bricks into pieces. Which is an interesting problem in of itself, right? Because you want to blow on brick lines. Did you actually shatter bricks at any point? No, never. So it was always a matter of staying true to that volume. Yeah. And presumably the physics of that is quite particular. Yeah, very particular. And there was a lot of simulations. I'm sure um, everybody will start to see some of the simulations that we were doing at the start of the project to really get that sense of, because when you, when you smash your Lego building, it doesn't sort of devolve into just bricks. Little sections of it will come apart and then, you know, other bits will have, like all the little detail bricks will fall off on their own. But Is it a pre-break strategy or were you going for something else? No, the guys in effects actually did a very um, sort of accurate representation of the, the kind of stickiness of all the bricks and, and they would break apart on a, a very random type scenario based on the kind of the... Um, uh, the kind of the build structure. So if you had like a, a wall that was built, you know, as you're supposed to build them with interleaving things, that would stay quite rigid. But if you built them in big long lines and they'd fall apart and sort of disperse as you'd expect, yeah. So it was really quite accurate, yeah. Wow. And then the rendering pipe, you've traditionally had a render man pipe that you've built on. Yep. Um, so as I said, the, the rendering problem was really unique. The, the kind of geometric, geometric detail that we're talking about was massive. Um, so we knew that we had to have, uh, we're we were going to have some problems, uh, or problems that obviously we needed to uh, focus on optimization. Um, that optimization came in the form of uh, a um, sort of proprietary renderer that we were initially going to use as a ray tracing accelerator for PRMAN. But as we as we sort of moved into production and the guys, um, particularly Max Liani and a guy called Luke, em Luke Emrose, um, as they started to uh, develop this um, uh uh, accelerator for PRMAN, it became apparent that we could actually take it into a primary renderer. So we started to push um, our internal renderer to uh, animation and layout, and they would, we would render with this this, this um, uh, sort of proprietary renderer. What was it that you were getting out of your proprietary renderer that you weren't getting out of a, you know, state of the art PR man? Because PR man has got a lot of versatility, it has a physically based uh, plausible shading and lighting models. Yep. Um, I mean, I think, I think as with anything that's proprietary, uh, the beauty of a proprietary software is um, 
while it has a certain amount of overhead uh, in terms of development, those kinds of things, you only develop it specifically for the things that you need at that time. So it has the functions that are specific to the problem that you're dealing with at that moment. Um, and that that really came to the fore in this instance. Like Lego is a very particular problem. But would the render barrier be valid going on to other projects? Yes. Yeah. Right. So we, we, it's a lucky situation in in that we got the chance to sort of develop this renderer um, with a very what is seemingly a small subset of rendering problems, i.e., geometric complexity. Um, the the material side of things is is relatively uh, con contained in that it's a Lego material. We don't have to do fur, and we don't have to do yes, so, you know yeah. all these different types <laughs> of things, and, cloth, and yeah. those kinds of things. It literally is plastic of different colors and different opacity and all sorts of the you know effectively the Lego kind of paradigm. We developed some incredible tools to uh, to enable the lighters to do a key shot, and then you could apply that light rig to many of the other shots and get a really, really good result. Um, so uh, that process was really interesting because you could optimize the kind of the lighting artists. They they could really deal with hundreds of shots quite easily. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but before the trailers came out, there was a sort of a skepticism of how this is going to work. There'd been other animated, there'd been commercials with animated Lego pieces. It seems to me that it was the power of the performances and the humour that you got in that trailer that caused it, as we're talking, to have, I think, a 98% rating on Rotten Tomatoes in terms of uh, people wanting to see the film. So it, did you always know that you were going to hit the right beats or was there a moment before it was released where you were going, good God, I hope people actually buy into this? <laughs> No, I don't think you. I don't think you ever know. I think. I think internally, everybody was really excited by the project. And it's funny when you when when you're in the heart of it and you're in the middle of the production and stuff. Um, and Lego, more so than any project that I've ever worked on, um, there is there is a sense of what you're doing is uh, enjoyable and fun and and uh, groundbreaking. You know, uh, Happy Feet, Guardians, all those things. They have elements of it that are that are different and new. Um, and in, and in this case, and Lego was no different. You know, it was like while we're in the middle of it, it felt like something new and something different. And the animators were having an incredibly good time about it. You know, everybody was really enjoying the process. And I think when those first trailers came out, and people started to question whether or not it was CG or whether or not it was um, stop motion, there was high fives all around because basically, it, it, you know, for the first time there was an animated film where people didn't actually know how we'd done it. And and I think that was really really. Uh, it was a really pleasant surprise for everybody involved. You know, it, there was and, and seeing the kind of feedback that we got was was just you know icing on the cake for the work that was currently happening in, in, internally, and it really got the kind of energy levels going up and stuff. It, you know, it's it's been an interesting project in that regard. Yeah, the film has really distinctive environments. I mean, really quite distinctive, and yet your I guess I don't know paintbrushes to work with seem somewhat limited in the sense you've got to use the same construction materials each time out. How'd you go about? getting that sense of different environments, and was it just as simple as colour? Uh, it was a matter of using um, colour, but also sometimes unique bricks and obviously unique build styles, depending on the environment. Um, a lot of the environments we, we sort of travel through are fairly familiar, um, cities, Wild West locations and so on, um, and a lot of those environments also had um, essentially Lego builds that already existed for them in some respect, so. But let's say you've got a canyon. Mm -hmm. Are you saying, I'm gonna design this canyon with these bricks in mind, or is it just like, that's a good design of a canyon, now some procedural model, go turn that okay. into bricks? It was a mixture of it was a mixture of doing that, but also uh, specifically simplifying the canyon designs down. We found, um, say if we were designing a landscape, if we just went in there and just essentially modeled a realistic landscape and just filled it full of bricks, it ended up looking very kind of aliased and noisy. Um, and we ended up looking at a lot of um, sort of simplified, impressionistic um, versions of mesas where they almost uh, felt like the old uh, Looney Tunes cartoons where there are much simpler shapes and we would either fill those with bricks or in some cases uh, create them as matte paintings so that we're creating landscapes that are sympathetic to the shapes of the bricks as opposed to uh, simply taking an organic shape and filling it full of bricks. So I've always been a huge fan of the effects animation guys in just adding production value. Like you had some smoke here, some atmospheres here, a bunch of stuff like that. You can really sell a shot, make it grand, make it look expensive. But you don't have that luxury quite so much because like a lot of the smoke literally is blocked into sort of Lego pieces and stuff. But it did seem you're using glares and flares and stuff to get some of that atmosphere. Can you talk about that process of giving it a reality, given that you just couldn't use maybe some of the normal tricks? Tricks. Yeah, I mean, we obviously, most of the stuff was built out of Lego, including some of our hero effects, water and so on. Um, but we deliberately wanted the film to feel atmospheric as if it was a large scale, 
um, film but shot on a much, much smaller scale. Um, there's a photographer named Evano who does these beautiful uh, photographs of Lego toys. Um, and you can see them on the internet as a Flickr account. Um, we actually talked to him and, and he sort of described how uh, Douglas Trumbull influenced his, uh, his, his work um, by creating sort of essentially smoke tanks or uh, much, much smaller environments filled with much, much more atmosphere than you might otherwise have. And that's essentially the approach we took whilst doing the Lego movie. If we wanted to create atmospherics, we would put moats in that would be larger scale than you might have in a normal film. Um, and we'd also pump the sets full of uh, probably much more smoke than you might have in a normal movie. But that's what a DOP might do on a live action set as well to create a sense of atmosphere and a sense of depth in the shot. Yet the actual smoke plumes, like you blow something up, mm -hmm. are very distinctively not. not that sort Built of from uh, Lego, yeah. exactly. You know, and so we would have to, you know, create those plumes out of transparent bricks sometimes and backlight them, so you might actually get that effect of um, that that you might get in real smoke, where it's actually. It's very growing. binary, isn't it? It's mm. like it's there or it's not. Mm. You don't get to fade it off. No. Um, and like just the idea of fading out some smoke is just you know, 101 stuff, and yet you can't even do that. Yeah, we had to. The effects guys had to sometimes fade through various levels of colors as if we were doing this on a live action uh, stop motion set you might go from dark gray to light gray and then light gray to transparent white and then white to clear and then nothing sometimes we would actually do it via the size of the bricks so you start with a big brick and then cycle through down to smaller and smaller bricks um, and that was a way of creating the effect of something fading off without literally fading it off the studs on the Lego pieces define very much where pieces connect to other pieces. So not only are you restricted to blocks, but how those blocks, and in fact how those characters or props sit mm. on the landscape is quite sort of dictated to by the studs, assuming you kept to that rule. Yeah, we, we, where, where possible, in close-up shots obviously we kept to it because you could tell where stuff was intersecting. Um, and we went through a whole QC process where we'd point out just intersections and so on and try and resolve those either in modeling or in animation. Um, the, f the thing about Lego and the, the, the thing that makes it interesting to me in terms of the way you build with it um, is it's all about context. So when you're, um, when you're up close on something, if you put a, uh, a banana in someone's hand and, a, and it's yellow, then, then it looks like a banana and then you can actually take that banana and stick a couple of studs on the end of it and it looks like a gun. So it's this, it's this interesting process of of depending on how you use these bricks and depending on um, on what context you use them, totally changes uh, the way you perceive them in a story. From a production design point of view, is it harder being faced with the job of I need a city yeah. or I need inside Emmett's brain in a sort of a ethereal landscape? Um, I think the ethereal landscape is always more difficult. That went through a whole bunch of uh, discussion. Not a, not a huge amount of actual design work. We actually talked about the, the concepts on that one a lot more than we actually uh, drew it. Um, and we went down all these sort of interesting paths from you know the, the Matrix Dojo kind of world to a world where it's just all the part numbers floating around. And that actually evolves into another concept which we use in the movie um, later on. And eventually, you know, Chris and Phil said, look, all we want is simplicity. It needs to be kind of... Um, Impressive but simple, um, dumb pressive is a word that Phil used um, in the making of it. In, in terms of it should be you know inc incredibly simple to the point where it seems dumb, but also really really visually impressive. And that's when we started looking at you know, photography on salt lakes and, and and things that are that are stark and simple and created essentially a salt lake from its mind where it was um, deliberately empty but lit with these uh, transparent underlit bricks so that it had like a sense of beauty and might have, you know, might have been able to, uh, to hint at something more in Emmett's personality. Because I think the rendering really delivered you a good uh, sort of contribution there because it is visually pretty impressive from a render point of view. There's like that much transparency and that much mm. light moving around. And yet, you're right, it's flat and nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was entire, that scene entirely was hinged on the lighting and shading in terms of the look. Um, and honestly, like when we were pitching the concept, we were like, oh, we'll be able to pull this one off. And, and, and surprisingly, with the, the sort of new rendering technology we developed in-house, we were actually able to pull that off much, much quicker than, than, than we thought in terms of um, getting results that were rendering on ones, not just every 10 frame, but actually uh, fully animated without noise, really, really um, 
early on in the process. In an animated film like this, does the character costume propping and stuff all fall under you in production design, mm -hmm. or was there a separate team that we'd call? Because they're not really cloth sims or anything else like that, but of course there is wardrobe and character design. Yeah, well, the uh, the there are a couple of areas where we did character design. Initially, it was the art department um, where we would come up with uh, decals for custom characters or mix and match pre-existing uh, decals on Lego characters. Um, the Lego company also contributed um, some of the design work on some of the background characters. But um, later on, as as the production was um, flowing, um, animation had the ability to create their own characters if they wanted to, and effects um, created characters as well. So all the, uh, the background characters in Cloud Cuckoo Land were sort of randomly generated with mixing and matching decals and various hair pieces like a kid might do. Um, or if, uh, if an animator wanted to come up with a new character, they might call up, you know, the doctor over here and then give him a different hairstyle or her a different hairstyle in a shot, depending on, on their needs. So there were various departments who were able to actually create and, and contribute to the movie uh, throughout the process. So the team that flowed out from that, were they making just a ton of stock, for example, hair pieces, mm. in the Lego sense that you would just grab one and stick it on? Mm. Or was it much more... Um, that things were very much designed just for when they would be needed and for what they were needed for. Yeah, there were sort of two levels in terms of uh, asset design and um, and surfacing and shading. Um, one was actually building stuff on the brick level, i.e. building the bricks themselves, and the second level was then actually building things where those bricks come together. So modelers um, had to spend a long, tedious amount of time actually sort of reproducing the bricks that we sometimes we got the CAD data direct from, directly from Lego and they would have to essentially remodel them in such a way that they became usable in the production and in the pipeline. Um, and then later on, those same artists might then be given the task of designing a car or, or coming up with what a set might look like based on a sketch um, simultaneously in the art It has to be a car operated by a character that has a... <laughs> oh, yeah, one of the things we... we, we we had to force ourselves to do was to actually embrace the limitations of the medium as opposed to trying to cram the medium into some um, idea of what we th thought it should do. So, you know, we actually thought it was kind of cute that rather than Emmett actually having his fingers wrap around the steering wheel and do that, you know, his hands were deliberately away from the steering wheel and he drove it as if a real Lego character would do it. That was, that was a, a sort of big part of, uh, of learning how to actually make the movie was learning to dumb it down a little bit and not overthink some of these concepts. And don't forget, we rely on your support via our Insider program. As an Insider member, you allow us to do shows just like this one. And we try and say thanks by posting bonus exclusive content for Insider members. So check it out on the homepage at fxguide.com. Well, that's it for now. Until next time, see ya. For more industry news, in-depth features, podcasts and forums, check out fxguide.com. And for visual effects training, check out fxphd.com.